Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited to see you um, across all the different streaming services that we're, that we're streaming on tonight. So tonight we're going to be talking about testing user delight using the Kano model. And we have a very special guest here tonight, um, Stephanie Stanislavski. I think I said that correctly. Um, and she's a senior product manager at Personio. You may have seen um, a video or two of her presenting at TEDx. Um, really very interesting stuff that she's been sharing there. Um, but just before I hand over to Stephanie, just a little bit about myself. So I've worked as a product manager for a few years. And before I joined Product People, I was working in the banking industry in fintech and estate planning scaling. Um, but I actually started off studying law. So I'm an attorney. And then I slowly moved into the more tech space and product management space um, as the years went on as I was um, working for the bank. So as you can hear, I can speak English, but um, I actually grew up speaking Afrikaans. So that's my heritage language. That's the language that I speak at home and that I speak to my mom. I think most of you probably won't know that language really, but uh, yeah, that's, that's my heritage language. And uh, just something about product people. So we're really on a mission to help companies deliver great and awesome products faster and to also be part of the discovery with them as well. Um, we love onboarding fast, aligning teams and delivering outcomes. And then obviously we also love what we're doing tonight. Um, just, you know, being part of the product management community and sharing knowledge generously. So thank you to all of you who are part of that community and who are here tonight. Um, just a moment to brag, you are all part of an 11,000 member strong um, product management community. So, so thank you for, for also being here tonight. Um, so what we're going to do just to kind of Break the ice a little bit into the topic that we're going to discuss tonight. So we're going to ask you two questions. You'll see a poll for some of the people that are on Zoom. You'll see a poll popping up. Um, and the people on the other um, streaming services, you can just give us the answers in the chat. Um, so the two questions are, are you familiar with the Kano model? And the second one is, what do you rely on to measure customer satisfaction? So you have some options for both of them that you can answer. So are you familiar with the Kano model? One, not at all. Two, I heard about it. Three, I know about it, but I don't use it. And four, I know about it and I use it. And then what do you rely on to measure customer satisfaction? Um, interviews, surveys, web analytics like Mixpanel, Heap, et cetera, um, usability test, reviews, or other. And then tell us what those others are. So I know that uh, customer satisfaction and how to measure that would kind of depend on Sometimes who your customers are, what they look like, what your company looks like, what the type of product is that you're doing, what the type of industry is that you're, that you're working in. So I'm very excited to see just and interested and curious to see um, how different people um, think, you know, around measuring customer satisfaction. Don't know if everyone has started thinking about this and putting in their answers yet. What I can see from the chat is that some people are saying they've never heard about it at all. Some of them are saying that they know it and they use it. More people are saying not at all, which is actually, I think maybe some of us thought that that would happen. Um, so a lot, a very split between not at all and heard about it. And looking at what people use to, to measure customer satisfaction, we have quite a strong winner here, that's web analytics, mixed panel, heap, et cetera. And we also have some people saying surveys and then a lot of other people also saying reviews. So yeah, that was, that's quite interesting. Um, I love using usability tests as well. And I see not a lot of people have answered that one, but that's one that I, that I usually like as well. And uh, I think now that we've done all of that, you're probably tired of hearing my voice and very interested and itching to hear from, from Stephanie. So I'm going to hand over to her. I'm going to unshare. And then Stephanie, you can share your presentation from your side. We're looking forward to hearing from you a lot. Yeah, of course. Let me see what I, what I need to do. Okay, cool. So let me share my screen with you guys. All right. Are you looking at my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we are. Wonderful. Well, welcome to today's topic on product roadmap prioritization using the Kano model, the Kano model. I think it's the Kano model because it was um, founded by a, a Japanese guy, but not sure though. <laughs> anyway, really nice to be here with all of you. Really happy to be surrounded by product people. I'm usually surrounded by bankers. So very happy that today's not the case. Just a quick intro. 
to myself. My name is Stephanie Stanislavski. As um, Stefan already presented, I'm a senior product manager at Personio. Um, I'm also the founder of Predict the People, uh, which is a startup that uses machine learning to understand a little bit more about e employee um, engagement, employee satisfaction, and then prioritize the HR cycle to each one, each person's personality. Very interesting uh, topic. I already sold my startup, but it's it's still a, um, an ongoing project there. And I'm also a mom of three girls, which is definitely my biggest and most challenging job right now. Um, so starting a little bit on the topic of, of Kano model, right? Um, Product prioritization is definitely one of the most or the most important things that we do as product managers, right? When we go into the job description, everyone is like, yeah, they need to prioritize work. They need to know what to do next, right? That's really what we're here for. So we definitely need to understand the importance of the different features that we have that we can potentially build, right? And how can we turn that into a roadmap or how can we create value from different features that we have in front of us? There's always a lot to do, right? I have like right now sitting at my table in, in Personio about five different or seven different products, right? And from those, I can do so many things. It's really like an infinite amount of work. So, and obviously I have only six uh, developers and I only have a certain amount of time to do this. So how, right? How to prioritize this? What is the right approach to do it, right? We have a lot of options, but which one is the right one? So before I jump into the, the presentation, I want to tell you a little bit more about the situation that I was in and the reason why I used Kano model recently. So I, I, I started working in Personio in October. And when I started working in Personio, they were building, um, yeah, they were building the sidebar. We were, we're doing a major, major re rebranding and we're doing a major work on Personio. So stay tuned because it's going to be amazing. So we were both building the new uh, navigation in Personio and we were working on a specific feature, right? Where we wanted to um, like uh, add an item to the sidebar where you could see your most visited pages, right? So that was something, it was a feature on the sidebar. When you hover on it, you would see your most visited pages. And, but we were right at the beginning of this major rebrand and major redesign of the navigation. And I was like, okay, but wait, why? Why are we doing this, right? I had just joined Personio, so I didn't want to be super intruding, but it just didn't make sense to me. Like, why are we spending time and resources on this? What sort of data do we have? Why are we doing, right? And they were like, well, because, you know, I think it would really add a lot of value to the user. It would, it would increase the, the efficiency of navigation. And I was like, yeah, but are they even going to value this? You know, is this something that's going to provide them like that delight and that sense of awesomeness or not? So because I had no answers and no data to back of my hunch, I decided to run a Kano model. And basically what I did is I reached out to all of our users through our newsletter and I asked them to answer a couple of questions. And from those questions, I was able to understand what of which of the features that we had in front of us would provide them most delight, right? Which ones would like would really blew up their minds? And I figure out that the most visited item on the sidebar was definitely ranked at the bottom of the list. So that's where I decided and said, like, you know, we can definitely build stuff that is going to provide them the awesomeness that we want to uh, with the new, you know, the new navigation. And these feature in concrete is like really, you know, wasting our resources. So I basically killed the feature <laughs> and um, that was my first day in Personio. So I don't know how many friends I have in there, but anyway, that was really what the Kano model gave me, right? The data to back up the decision and say, this is not going to provide the awesomeness, the delight that we want to, to our users. So with that being said, I'm going to be explaining the Kano model, but going back to my experience so that you can see the most applied way to use a Kano model, not only like theory. So we, I think we're all very familiar 
with some of the weighted score model um, prioritization frameworks like RISE, ICE, BOC, or DIE, right? These are built upon like a, a combination of data points and or educated guesses in an attempt to bring that objectivity, objectivity to how we prioritize the roadmap. Um, so it looks like that, right? Something like this, you have, you end up with uh, a table where you propose your different initiatives, right? Your different features, and then you rank them in benefit versus cost framework, right? Depending on the number of criteria that we have. And then depending on the scores that you came up, you make a cut, right? So it's like, these are the top three. These are the ones that we're gonna be working on this queue. And then the rest will be a uh, backlog. So I, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this, right? It's, it's really using real data, right? But sometimes we don't have the data to back it up, right? Even if we say like the impact, sometimes it's really hard or the confidence. If you don't have already like a prototype and you've done user validation, what level of confidence you have? I think it's like very, very little, right? So this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated for, for users and for product managers. Um, so in my opinion, these frameworks have like two problems. First, the outcomes are a little bit arbitrary, right? I really think so. And the second, they don't solve the actual reason why prioritization is hard. So I'm gonna go deep into these two things. Um, the first one I already mentioned, um, these are sometimes when we're measuring these, many of the, of the um, scores that we give are unknown when we are addressing these priorities, right? So when we do this, like on the, on the um, when we do RISE, for example, what is the impact of a new navigation menu? I mean, you can try really hard to say like, how many users will use the navigation menu? How many new customers will we bring with a navigation menu, right? But it's really complicated. And if we move to the confidence, I already mentioned, right? Unless you already have a prototype, you've validated with the users, but not only for the navigation, you've done like 30 different prototypes to measure all the different things. Everything starts to become quite blurry. Right. And then you start giving numbers a little bit out of hunch, to be honest. Right. So I think these frameworks are really good to help us identify the quick wins. Right. It's really easy to see which ones are going to be that low effort, high impact. Um, I don't think we actually need a, 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 a framework for that. If we are familiar with our products, I think we can do that pretty quickly. But then we start to run low on those quick wins, right? And then that's really where things start to get a little bit complicated um, because, yeah, I mean, according to Martin Kagan, right, at least half of our ideas are not going to work. So already know that half of whatever we put in there is not really going to work and we don't have enough data to back it up. The second thing is... Yeah, it's, it really doesn't solve the problem on why prioritization is hard, right? And in the end, prioritization is about saying no, saying no to many things. And that's really something that is very complicated, right? Because maybe you, you make a cut and you say like, these three things are the ones that we're going to be working on. But what about the other ones? What if they were still good ideas? When do you go back to them, right? And what about the iterations to the initial ideas that you initially implemented? When do you go back? Do you include those iterations as part of the of the items that you're going to prioritize, or you always go for new features? So again, I think when we go into these very data oriented frameworks, it it starts to get complicated. What I usually do is that I involve as many people as possible to make sure that it's as less biased as possible, and I have more in, inputs from different, um, yeah, different colleagues, right, design, engineering, leadership, et cetera, to make sure that that prioritization is as honest and as tangible as possible. Because if I answer it by myself, I realize that I do start to, things do get a little bit blurry. So again, um, quoting Marty, K uh, Marty Kagan, um, yeah, even when the great ideas are proved to be valuable, right, and feasible, it usually takes several iterations, right, to make the idea a real product. 
So then obviously that's when you start to run into like, do I go for V2 of what I already implemented or do I go for any other feature? What's the impact of these little iteration versus the previous iteration? So again, that's really where it gets a little bit um, granular. So now moving to Kano, right? Moving to a different way of addressing these priorities. Kano on the other side really tries to focus on the intangible benefits that specific features or initiatives brings to customers. And it's really insightful to see this kind of input and prioritization because yeah, you're not looking at the individual feature, but more like areas of opportunities, right? And that's really what I did with the um, Cano model. It was really not about that specific thing, but then when I laid the other options, it really gave me like a roadmap, a very high level view roadmap of what were the uh, initiatives that would bring most delight to the users and then what sort of features lived in those initiatives. I think both models are great and we need them both, right? But in some cases you might need both. In some cases you might just need the Kano model. So today I'm sharing when do I believe you could use the Kano model for, for your priorities. So yeah, as I said, with the Kano model, you're really evaluating the impact on your customers' emotions and the attempt to find features that will delight them. It's completely contrasted to the weighted scoring model, right? Where we try to be as, as objective as possible and with, you know, like more benefit cost data inputs. Um, in the end, you want to create a product roadmap with the right features, right? And there are many reasons why you might want to include a given feature, but in the end, we want to make our customers happy and we want to, you know, create, um, choose the, the, the features that would bring that delight or that happiness and, you know, will we'll inc increase the engagement or increase the adoption or increase the uh, acquisition. So, yeah. How do we measure satisfaction? How do we choose what to build in order to provide the satisfaction? And how do we go from satisfaction into the light, which is a little bit step forward, right? And of course, these questions are hard to answer, but we, we have the Kano model to help us out. So yeah, this is the man behind the Yay framework. It's Noriaki Kano. That's why I think it's Japanese. Um, a Japanese researcher, and his ideas on customer satisfaction were based on the following premises. The first one is customer satisfaction with products features depends on the level of functionality that is provided. So that, that's a little bit what I was telling you, right? How much or how well they've been implemented. Obviously, the satisfaction that an MVP provides is not the same satisfaction that it provides with on the, on the third or fifth um, version. Features can be classified in four categories. We're gonna go through those. And anyone really can determine how customers feel about a feature questionnaire. Those were the, the things that he came up with in the 80s. These are the uh, So we have customer satisfaction and functionality. So, we have, oh, I think, yeah, it's good. Okay. We have delight, delighted, satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, and frustrated. We're going to go into those. But as you can see, people can even get annoyed with a feature or not, you know, very well um, understanding the impact that it's going to have. And I'm going to give you an example of that. And then functionality, we can go from no, like nothing has been implemented to it has been fully implemented and it's the best version that it can be, right? Some could be an MVP, basic could be a V1, V2, and then V3. These are the four categories that we can end up uh, with in terms of the Canon model and our features. We have attractive features, we have performance features, we have must be or must have features, and we have indifferent features. Okay, we have a couple more that I'm going to address later on, but let me explain what each one of these means. So the first one are the performance features, the first one that I'm going to be discussing. And this one is really very straightforward, right? The more you provide these features, the more satisfied the customers become. 
These are, for example, um, things that make the product faster, right? Uh, or that it makes the product r runs more smoothly. For example, the storage space in your Dropbox amount, uh, in your Dropbox amount. The more you have of that, the happier you're going to be with Dropbox, right? So it's really very linear. If you put more investment in end time and resources into performance feature, the effort will in fact result in a linear increase in customer delight. Okay, so the more we impress, the more we, we have on these things. You're probably already thinking about maybe performance features in your specific products. Um, so yeah, in the end, the investment is also very much corresponding to the, uh, to the return. Now we have the next ones are the must be or the must have features. And these ones are thresholds. If you don't have them, you're, you're screwed basically, right? So people expect them, right? It's like they're needed, they're necessary. If you don't have them, your, your, your product is not going to fly. So I don't know, for example, a navigation menu or for example, a search bar or for example, you know, these sort of things that right now are like industry standards. You need to have these things to be really competitive in the market. Um, but as you can see, it rarely crosses the line of satisfaction. Like it really doesn't provide that crazy feeling like, oh, you have a search bar. Oh, my God. You know, I'm going to buy it because it's amazing. No, they just expect it. And either you have it or you're out of market. That's like the most the must have features. Um, then we have the attractive ones. These are the wow features. These are the things that people don't love. Right. And they actually tell people about it. So these are the things that really blow people's minds. Um, but sometimes they don't even ask for them. But sometimes they don't even know that they want these features. So they're like the secret uh, ingredient. Um, and this is where really the expertise of a product manager is really is really important. Right. So we need to ask the right questions to figure out if the uh, there are attractive features in the ones that we're con considering or not. But we are the ones who need to think about the features, right? So these are really the things that will make your, your product stand out. As you can see, it also requires a lot of effort, right? But the satisfaction is quite exponential. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's really good. Um, and then finally, the indifferent, right? There, there are features that, you know, they just don't provide any sort of value no one is excited about it. No one is really anything. So in this case of my example of the um, sidebar with the most recent um, pages, it ended up being an indifferent feature. So really no one considered it amazing. No one, you know, no one was excited about it. So like, why spend resources on that when we can potentially build more performance, must have or attractive features instead? Okay. At the same time, Canon categories are, are, are not static and they change over time. Unlike diamonds, Canon categories are not forever. So let me give you a couple examples, right? Um, when, yeah, when, when people are super excited of an, an, an attractive feature, after they used it for a while, it stops being interactive and it becomes performance or even a must have, right? So back in the, in 27, when we had our, our iPhones and we had this amazing screen, right? We were like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Nowadays, it's more of a must have maybe feature, right? So it moved by the, yeah, by the, the, the usage, by the adoption. So the same thing happens to the other ones. A performance might end up being a must have, right? And a must have must might end up being an indifferent. So these are the, the these are the things that make you want to test regularly, you know, to make sure that you keep pace of the feelings of the of the yeah of the thoughts of your users. So it's very important that you understand that it's not going to stay forever the um, the category that you initially had. Now let's let's start moving to the application of Cano. How can you do this uh, yourselves, right? So the first one is remember what Mr. Cano mentioned. You can actually measure that delight through through questionnaires. So how to build those questionnaires? We need to ask questions 
in two ways, the functional and the dysfunctional. So we're going to be asking our customers how they feel if they have that feature and how they feel if they don't have the feature. Okay. And they are not open-ended. So you're not going to ask, how do you feel? And then they're going to throw a, a paragraph. You're going to have five potential answers. So you have, I like it. I expect it. I am neutral. I can tolerate it. And I dislike it. Those those are the things that they can answer. So for example, if you could ask, um, if you have a filter to make your nose smaller, how do you feel? And then they're gonna say, I like it, I expect it, I am neutral. So let's say that they say, I like it. But then you're gonna ask the same question. If you don't have a, feet, a filter to make your nose look smaller, how do you feel about it? And they can say like, I'm neutral, you know, like, okay if I have it I'm going to be super happy but if I don't have it I'm going to be okay then you know it's um performance I must be a most uh, or, or, or um an, an amazing feature right so depending on the answer of both the combination provides you one of the categories so that's why it's very important to to ask both the functional and the dysfunctional um question um there are a couple of things that we also need to consider when it comes to how we word those questions. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper there. And there are new ways of, uh, of answering those questions. So we're also going to go into those to make sure that it's super clear for your users. What exactly are you asking? Um, are you asking them? Um, all right. So in the end, you're going to have some kind of table like this, right? Where you're gonna have, for example, the um, the indifferent here. So when they, this is the dysfunctional and this is the functional. So when on the functional, they say, I don't care. And then when on the dysfunctional, they say, I expected is considered an indifferent one, okay? This is a performance, this is an attractive, this is a, what else? A must have, right? And then you're going to see we have two letters that I haven't yet discussed. This is reverse and this is questionable. So R for reverse and Q for questionable. Reverse are the things that make people quite annoyed. Okay. So quite annoyed when they actually ask, okay, if you had the, if you don't have this feature and they say like, that's, that would be perfect. I don't want that feature. Right. But then you create that feature. They're going to say like, I hate the feature. Right. So that's why these are reverse they actually create the opposite of what we are expecting. They create this like. And the questionable are basically things that don't make sense, right? So things that you can rule out because they just don't make sense. So it, it might look quite mathematical at this point, but there are already tools that help you come up with this table. And there's a template that I'm going to be showing you which is also, it also makes your job um, so much more easier so that you can quickly identify which which uh, of these potential answers you're going to get per, per feature, okay? So it's, uh, yeah, it's actually quite quite easy to see. Um, but yeah, that's the reverse and questionable. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we do have another, okay. Yeah, okay. Now, now that we know the basics, let's see this in action, okay? So I'm going to be sharing with you uh, what we just did. Our goal as product managers already is to determine which features lead to more satisfied customers and use that information to help us prioritize what we need to build. There are important details to consider in order to get there in every step of the process, choosing features and users for analysis, getting the best possible data from users, and analyzing the results. So we're going to go one by one to understand what do they mean. Now, choosing the right features for Arcano, uh, Arcano um, survey. The features that you use for the study need to be need to have a meaningful benefit for the user. So it cannot be technical debt. It cannot be something that the sales team are requesting. It cannot be reporting to, uh, the system or design refresh. It really has to be like tangible features that have a, a, a benefit for the end users. Um, yeah, otherwise they're out of the Cano model analysis, right? We're really measuring the customer satisfaction with externally tangible features. So what I, what I did on my Cano model when I started, um, these were some of the things 
recently visited, suggested pages, advanced search, navigation menu, analytics reports, dashboard, customizable homepage, and newsfeed. We also want to limit the amount of features because otherwise it becomes really long. I mean, consider that you're going to have two questions per, per one of each, right? So in this case, I think I ended up with seven. Yeah. So it was to the minimum 14 questions that you user needed to to answer so if we already struggle with one nps um question in our in our products right i think 14 is already quite a lot so try to do this anywhere between three and potentially 10 but maybe not more than that now selecting the customers who are you going to be asking um these questions right so you need to consider some kind of demographic, some kind of logical grouping or, or a specific persona to get your question, your answers. Otherwise, you're going to get your data all over the map, right? What I did, we reached out to HR managers from companies from 10 to 150 employees, so more on the small, small side of things. They, they needed to already be very familiar with the product and the features, so more like late adopters. And we didn't filter for any industries or countries. Okay, we just said like that's that's as much as we get. Um, so in your case, when you're doing this, just think what makes sense, right? Who are who's your target persona, or who would you like to be building something in concrete? Maybe it's for maybe it's for the users, maybe it's for the admins, maybe it's for early adopters, maybe it's for late adopters, maybe it's for a specific region that you would like to get your results for a specific profile. Whatever it is, just really try to narrow down your group of people to get the most valuable results. Um, yeah, and then getting the best data. To get the best data, you need to write the most clear questions. So making your questions as clear as possible is really going to help out a lot. Um, phrasing the, the questions towards the benefits and not towards the product, right? It's really going to change. So for example, if you can automatically improve how your photos look, how do you feel? It's definitely better than if you have magic fix, how do you feel, right? Because no one knows what magic fix is. And that this functional is not the opposite of the functional, it's just the absence. So if you cannot automatically improve how your photo looks, how do you feel? That would be that this functional. All right. And then, yeah, make sure that you have um, the, the, yeah, the best possible way to present this. There are many tools already out there. And in this presentation, I'm going to be sharing a couple links. But I just use the type form, to be honest. And something that is very, very important is that you add wireframes next to the question to make it as clear as possible, right? So whenever possible, try to add wireframes, a little video, something that brings more context to your users, because otherwise it can end up being like quite, you know, quite, quite untangible, I guess, for them. And then from those five different answers, you can tweak them a little bit if you think it's not clear enough. So this is, um, there's another researcher called Robert Bloth, who's also very much into Kano. And these are the ones that he proposes. Um, this would be very helpful. This is a basic requirement. This would not affect me. This would be a minor inconvenience and this would be a major problem. Okay, these are the ones that he suggests. What I did is I would be very pleased. I expect that. I am neutral. I can live with it. That would bother me a lot. Those were the ones that I, I included, right? And one more thing that I did is that I asked people to rank the importance of the features from not important to extremely important. And that would already give me um, like an additional data point to really understand you know, how, how eager are they to get that feature and really separate the big features from the small ones, right? Depending on the customer's uh, decision for importance. So this is what we got. Um, usually with Kano, you have two different things. One are the discrete results and the other ones are the continuous. Continuous really show you how your, um, how your, your features features are changing, right? They can be must have, but you can already have a hint of where are they moving towards. 
And the screen is right right now, what is the, their feature, right? Right now, where are they based? Right now, what are the thoughts of your users? So this is what we got. For example, as you can see, lots of the features that we suggested were considered indifferent as a discrete result, right? Except for, for example, homepage, which is attractive, favorites, which is also attractive, and the dashboard, which is also attractive. But then if we go for the indifferent and we try to analyze a little bit the continues, we can see that, for example, the menu is also a must, a must have, right? In this case, the advanced search could also be quite attractive. The homepage, um, yeah, that, well, the homepage is already interactive um, and so on. So I also feel like really going for the continuous analysis will provide you a lot of information. And again, most of these tools already give you uh, both discrete and continuous analysis. So yeah, I think the, the analysis really gave me a great first level understanding of the user's feelings and the user's uh, priorities, right? Because remember, we also mentioned like, if you could, you know, organize this from the most important to the least important, how you do that. And I think that really helped us understand what were the most important features that we needed to build, not from my perspective as a product manager, for, but for the users that we're building the products for, right? Um, and that really helped me like either test design ideas or make a rough draft of the roadmap. And obviously, if we want to dig deeper into the different answers that we got, we can do that either by the continuous analysis or just go into um, yeah, user usability testing or just interviews. Pros and cons of Kano model. The pros are definitely that it's super efficient and easy to identify what brings the delight. It can be applied at any stage of the product life cycle. So right at the beginning or through it or at the end or whatever, it really doesn't have to be a very specific timing. The evaluation of the product market fit becomes simplified as the right priorities can be set early in the life cycle. It can help you create the right roadmap for a product. And it's particularly helpful in evaluating new product ideas and potential improvements, like the one I told you where we wanted to include that. And then we realized like no one really cared about it. Um, the cons is that you need to come up with the features. Okay, you need to come up with that list, you as product manager or whoever is building the, 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 the survey, right? So it's not really like asking them with like other tools that we have, like if you have 30 euros, what sort of features would you build? In this case, you need to come up with the features yourself and then address the uh, level of delights. Um, yeah, and if you wanna test or assess many, many features, the survey can become quite, quite long. As I already mentioned, you have at least two questions per feature, even three if you ask the relevance of your, of your uh, feature. So when to use this, right? Um, I think for me, it really well, worked very well when I needed the user's voice to tell me what would drive more satisfaction, to tell me if what I was building would really create that feeling of awesomeness or if I should be spending my resources on something else, right? And instead of me coming up with the data, it was them telling me what to do. Um, obviously, we want to have a standard framework, right? But honestly, like looking forward, I think I'm going to do a, a, a mix of both. I'm probably going to come up with a rice, but I will also come up with a Kano model to make sure that, you know, we're building the right features, not only for the business, but also for the users. Um, these are some of the tools that I was telling you about. So this one is pretty good. It's a, an online Kano tool um, that will give you the results. It also lets you create the survey, share it with your users and get back your answers. So it's pretty good and it's free. And I, I use the Nexo sheet, which is also here. And I don't know if you're gonna see it. I think you can see it, right? So in this, very normal Excel sheet. You just need to enter the, the results that you got from your type form. So again, I did it very manually, but here's where I, I put all the answers. And then you have a couple of hidden 
um, hidden pages there, hidden sheets. But in the end, you come up with a classification matrix so that you can know the category and the continuous category. So you know as well, where are they moving towards? So it's, I think it's pretty straightforward, obviously more manual uh, than this one, but yeah, to me, it just worked out well to do it like that. I added a couple of more learning materials. If you want to know more about the counter model, um, yeah, just a couple of videos there and uh, a couple of um, reports. And yeah, that's it. So I think we're now ready for the questions. But anyway, even if today we don't have enough time, if you have further questions, if you want to share with me your service at some point and get some feedback, super happy to support um, in any way that I can. I hope, Stefan, that I did it on the right side. I don't know. Yes, you did so well. Thank you so much. I think everyone um, got so much value out of what you presented today. I know I learned a lot with what you've shown. Um, it's things that you kind of think of, but the way that you showed it to us today was just really very practical. And it, I think it just made sense to everyone. I'm definitely gonna also just listen to this recording again and go and play around with the tools that you have here as well, because it, it looks so valuable. Thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, of course. Um, so you can unshare your screen now, yeah. then I can share mine again. Wonderful. Thank you. So let me just, just wanna make sure that I can open up the right screen here. Cool, so yeah, thank you everyone. And once again, thank you, Stephanie. That was just super awesome. I'm like, you were so excited while you were listening to it as well. Um, I made so many notes on, on I my saw page you as well. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so interesting. Um, so I think there's gonna be quite a few, quite a few questions. Um, okay. So we are going over to the Q&A uh, portion now, but what I'll do to give you some time to think of your questions and to write them is I'll just talk a little bit about product people again. And then once I'm done with that, I'll jump into the Q&As and then send those questions to Stephanie so that she can answer them for you. So just a little bit more on product people. So typically the use cases where we're most effective in is where you, for example, you have a startup and you've got funding and you need to grow your product team by one to five product managers, um, where your product manager is going on parental leave for three to 12 months or so, um, when your product manager is leaving or has left your company and you know that the hiring process can take a lot of time sometimes. So we can also help you in that situation. And then when you have a temporary initiative, but it's really urgent and it's really important Maybe you used the, the Kano model and you saw, you know, this feature needs to come in there immediately. Um, so in that situation, we'd also be able to help. And then <clears throat> um, if you'd like someone to come and appraise the product teams and the processes that they're working on. So we've had the opportunity to work with really cool clients before. Um, just if you could just list a few of them, like Zalando, Dr. Smile, Techstars, WeShare, Scout, Omeo, Freeletics, and Tia. Um, and this is just some of the positive feedback that we've gotten from, from our customers. And it's really great when you see this because then you know that you're, you know, on, on the right track and, and staying true to that mission. When you read stuff like, you know, we quickly understood the situation and it was super onboarding and things like that. So that's just some of the feedback that we've gotten. And then this slide is one of the slides that I think most people are most excited and happy about um, and including me. So what you can easily see on this slide is that we are quite a diverse team. So this is all the, all the team members of product people. So we're quite diverse. What you might not be able to see is that we're actually very well distributed across the world as well. So a lot of countries in Europe and then some of us are, are down in Africa. Um, so we're quite well distributed. And then um, um, just to note that we are legally... Um, um, uh, based in Berlin in Germany um, and you see there in the corner there's a place there that there isn't a picture so if you want to be part of this slide and also join this picture um, then we are hiring so product managers from all levels um, can can apply but we're also looking for a senior business development manager to help us grow our client base and also hold on to those to those customers that we do have. So you can go to productpeople.join.com and send us in your applications and we hope to see you join the team. So I hope I've given you enough time now to, 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 to figure out your questions. If you're on Zoom, feel very comfortable to put up your hand and ask your questions um, um, verbally as well. Um, but I will look at some of the, some of the questions. So Stephanie, I have one question here from Alicia and she's yep. asking, what are your thoughts on using this model a bit upstream for prioritizing opportunities or problem statements rather than solutions or features? Oh, sorry. <laughs> he, him. 
yeah don't worry about it. <laughs> um so alicia if 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 i understand correctly you would rather understand the problems that you would be solving rather than the features with which you would solve those problems right is that the case yes I mean, exactly stay away from solutioning maybe yeah yeah i'm i don't know i have no idea i think the 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 tool is really the framework is really for for features right because again it's really to understand what feature would bring most delight rather than which is the most painful pro problem that your user is 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 getting i guess by tweaking it a little bit you could also get like which is the biggest problem that you have right now but maybe there are better frameworks to figure out the biggest problem that your users have rather than you know which are the features that bring most delight but again we can definitely explore it right maybe do like a quick test run with a couple of users and and see what sort of responses you get um i haven't really thought about it but it could be a good idea why not thank you thank you stephanie and then just a question that that i had when i was listening to you as well is just how do you get the engagement from the customers to get these feedbacks? Because sometimes you send out emails and then the click rate is so low and then even yeah. the action rates are also even lower. So yeah. what's your, um, your tip for, for getting more engagement on these questionnaires? Yeah, so I one of the things that really worked out for me was to do it through the newsletter of Personio, right? So we reach to like, I don't know, 5,000 people or 3,000 people. From those 3,000 people, I got 100, result, 100 answers. So it's um, very, very small <laughs> if you consider that. But even 100 results were, you know, pretty good. Um, so... It, you know, it's, it's really try to get us, you know, to the bigger, bigger audience and then try to get as many answers as you can. Um, in my case, when I asked the U, my UX researcher how many answers I needed for it to be statistically relevant, he told me that anything about 50 answers was already pretty good. Okay. So when we got back somewhere around 80, 80 something answers. I knew that, you know, that was um, statistically relevant. So just make sure that you have any statistical relevance and reach to your biggest audience and, and try to make it as convincing as possible. I also remember that the email that I sent was like, yeah, we're building Personia together and, you know, we're, we're doing this together, like really trying to create mm -hmm. that sense of ownership on the users um, and I think it worked out pretty well. Um, we also have a very good community in Prestonio where, where the users really are very active in there. And I also posted the link and said like, hey, you know, this is where you, you're going to be heard. Like, make sure that you answer this because this is where, you know, we will be, we will be building this next feature. So make sure that you participate. And I think that's really, that also helped a lot to, to get those answers. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's like one practical and one also just playing on the emotion, using the right types of language and getting people to feel yeah. like they're part of the team. Yeah. Um, and then, Isami, I know you're, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly, but I know your hand is up. Is there a question that you would like to ask? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for this valuable presentation, all this uh, useful and helpful information. Um, I still have one concern with uh, with using this model. I think, yeah, this goes, from my point of view, this goes to the cons of, of, of this model is that with with all the efforts yeah, that you put on, on, on this, but finally you will be kept working on outputs rather than, you know, um, focusing on outcomes because finally we are talking only about features. So I will, what do you think about this point? Um, Esama, could you maybe re, um, re, rewrite your question a little bit? So instead of, yeah, could you maybe tell me a little bit more your question? So with, I didn't with, after, after applying the, the Kano model, we will yeah. come up with a prioritized list of features. Okay. Yeah, correct. And if we implement all of these features, finally, we are only providing outputs. And um, yeah. I've lost the, the how we link all of these outputs with, with the outcomes that we want to achieve. Yeah, so if you want to dig deeper into, into the Kano implementation, um, which I didn't 
dig too deep because it's only 20 minute presentation. But what they tell you is that you you usually need to pick, I think it's like two must haves, one performance and one attractive feature per, per, per cycle of development. So imagine it, it's a year of work. In a year, you're gonna pick two of those must haves, one performance and one, um, and one attractive feature. Um, and obviously this is the work of, that's one of the cons of, of Tano, right? You need to have those outputs. You need to know what to build next. So it's really like already on a feature-based framework, what are the things that you're gonna be working on? But again, it's pretty similar to a RISE or a, an ICE framework, where again, you have a list of features and you compare again, different data points. The only difference that those data points come from your users rather than coming from you or your team or even the business, right? I don't know if I, I if I answer your question, um, Esam. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, yeah, I think we are on the same page. So finally, we, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, focusing more on outputs uh, is somehow risky because with, with, with more focus on outcomes, this will make, I, from my point of view, this will make the whole prioritization thing more easier because um, this could be as a part of, I don't know, you are implementing a strategy and in each, part, um, each phase of your implementation, you, you have a couple of outcomes that you want to achieve. And then this will make your life easier because then you have a specific outcome that you want to achieve. And after that, you think about the features that will help you to achieve this. Exactly, exactly. But maybe you have more than one feature and then you figure out which one of those multiple features to solve that outcome, right, are the, is the one that is going to provide the most um, benefit. So going back to my example, Esame, the, the, out, the outcome, obviously, of everything that we were doing was to increase findability in Personio, improve the navigation in the product. How can you do that? You have multiple ways of doing it, right? Um, and one of those was the most visited pages. But there were also many other features that could have, you know, added to that outcome that we wanted. But then that's where really where the Canon model comes in, right? And so like, don't, don't waste time there. You can definitely waste time on other, other of the features, other of the things that you want to build, but not that. And that already gives you some data and say like, okay, I'm not going to waste resources on that, but rather on a different possibility. Thank you. Thank you for yep. your question, Isomi, and thank you for your answer, Stephanie. And then I think we probably only have time left for one more question. So there's a question from Claudia who asked, how did the stakeholders react? Did they just approve or was there still discussions needed? Um, she said that out of her experience, um, stakeholders still come up with better or more needed ideas or features. Yeah. Honestly, I just, I just went for it. Claudia, I just didn't ask a lot. I just knew that I needed to have an answer quickly because the feature was already being built and I knew that it was not the right feature to be built. So in one, when one week time, I created the survey. I launched it through the, uh, news uh, the newsletter. I got the results back in a couple of days. I you know, I came up with a presentation the week after and I just reached back to the to the um, stakeholders and say like, hey guys, you know, we were working on this, but it's definitely not the right thing to work on. We should rather focus on these different features because this is what our users are telling us, right? So in my case, I really didn't ask. I just came back with the data and it was well accepted. Um, but maybe if I would have asked, maybe, yeah, I would have <laughs> found more obstacles on the way, but I just didn't ask a lot. I just went for it. <laughs> she's happy with your answer i see she's saying lovely <laughs> and then i know we also have a hand raised i know we have about six minutes left so we have a yeah. hand raised by diana as well so i was hoping to give her a chance to ask you a question too yeah uh hello thanks and thank you stephanie for your presentation it was really really nice i really loved how structured it was and i have a question about like um as you said you've reached to your audience through emails or through social network. And it seems like uh, it's probably already the audience that 
already involved in the product a lot. Uh, how do you think maybe it's uh, more value to reach the audience that are not so involved in the product, but like use it uh, a lot, maybe not so much, but because maybe they have some obstacles and that's the reasons why they're more maybe valuable answers on them more valuable. And if so, how would you do this? And also how to balance between, you know, not to bother the people too much that they don't <laughs> get uh, negative emotions uh, fr from all these uh, questionnaires and everything. Thanks. Yeah, I I actually thought about it, uh, Diana, because I was considering either going for the HR managers, which are usually the people that are most used to Personio, that are most familiar with the product, or going to the employees, right? Which is also one of our end users in Personio. So they both use the platform. Most of the time it has been uh, built for those HR managers. So we have better clarity on, on their needs. But I also figure like, should I go for the employees instead? Should I ask them instead, right? Because they're, again, very, they, they need to use the product, but it's harder to reach to them. So in my case, again, because I needed to quickly get an answer and, um, you know, that feature in particular, I think it was more oriented for those HR managers that I decided to make that my, my group of, of users. If I would have gone for the employees instead, probably, or maybe the answers would have been different. Maybe they, they found more value on, on that specific thing. That's definitely something that I always wanted to do is like, should I've maybe raised, um, should I've maybe done a second kind of for employees or for supervisors and compare the answers? Maybe. I think that would have been super valuable. I just didn't have the time and I never did it. And how would I've reached to those employees? It's not easy, to be honest. It's not easy. Um, usually what we do is we go again through the HR managers and then we ask to, to share something with their employees and try to get answers from through the HR manager to those employees, because otherwise, yeah, you get the, you, you, you become very annoyed, right? Because obviously for, for employees, um, it's not their day-to-day -day tool. They just go there for when they need to ask for absences or to, for time tracking or something like that. So they don't visit person every day. Um, so we usually go through the HR manager. So in your case, uh, Diana, it really depends on your personas and who would you be asking. But if it's not so straightforward for you, you would maybe need to come up with a different idea or, I don't know, through LinkedIn or some other way for you to reach to those not so frequent personas that you could also get a lot of insights from. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe a quick uh, add. What do you think about pop-ups? Like, you know, sometimes you can see in the websites or uh, another thing like to go to the technical support queries, like what people maybe ask, asked for. Yeah, so like the NPS, right? So when you ask like, how happy are you with the product? Um, yeah. yeah, maybe you, the only thing is that maybe you just go for one or two features, right? Because I can imagine that you're going to put it on a, on a website, on, on your product and say like, how happy would you be with this feature? How happy would you be if it was not there? Something like that. And then maybe, you know, for that specific feature, where is it on the, on the access? But then I don't feel like you could be asking feature, like pop-up questions throughout your product. So, but maybe for one feature is not a bad idea. You could come up with a, the Kano access for one specific feature no? in your product with one of these pop-ups. Okay, so thank you very much. You're welcome, Diana. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was such a interesting back and forth. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, uh, we've, We've run out of time and luckily we could like get to your presentation and ask some questions. I think we could have kept you here until like nine o'clock tonight for a lot of questions. <laughs> but thank you for, for an awesome presentation and for answering all our questions. It was really special having you here, Stephanie. And I think everyone enjoyed it. We're getting a lot of messages on, on all the different streaming services of how much they enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, Stefan and Mansoor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you everyone else for joining and for being part of the community. Um, you can watch the, 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 the videos on all our different streaming services and you can join our different um, communities on these links as well. So thank you everyone.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.